Thank you, thank you, Marissa. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Um, uh, I really want to thank Marissa and the rest of the Five College Digital Humanities team, Kimberly Bain, uh, and especially our curators at the back channel there, Marielle and Jeffrey, um, and also the Frost Library for hosting this event. Uh, it's, it's a great place to be. Um, and, and certainly uh, very, very appreciative that you all came here today. Um, hoping that this talk is going to be a bit more of sort of an interactive performance. Um, and uh, so there will be many opportunities for you to uh, participate and contribute. Uh, primarily, there is a Twitter back channel. Uh, the hashtag is hash 5CDH. Uh, and feel free to tweet to that as uh, throughout the talk. Um, but there will also be a live in-person back channel. Uh, for those of you that d don't want to use uh, Twitter, um, Jeffrey back there. Jeffrey, if you could wave that around. He's got some index cards. And in a little bit, we're going to test this back channel. He's going to distribute the index cards around. And you can uh, write stuff there and, and post them back. I've got uh, three separate sort of uh, audience participation um, opportunities during this talk. And uh, we will more intentionally use the back channel during those, those opportunities. Okay. Um, also, when you came in and you sat down, you should have seen a copy of a police report on your chairs. Uh, does anybody here not have a copy of this police report? Um, if, if you don't, please uh, raise your hand, and Kimberly and others back there will get one to you. Uh, this police report will form a, sort of a parallel track throughout the, uh, this, this talk. And you'll see how it plays out in a little bit. Okay? But to start things off, what I thought we'd do is do a quick back channel introduction test. If you could uh, turn to a neighbor and just introduce yourself to your neighbor, um, and then either on Twitter or if you want to use an index card, I'd like you to each of you to uh, answer one of the following two questions. The first one is just like a sort of a vibe check. 
how are you all feeling right now? Uh, and you can write down whatever you want. You can tweet whatever you want about that. Or uh, if you want to uh, write down what is something that you're expecting from this talk? Just knowing uh, what you know about the title and about what Marissa said, uh, you know, uh, what are you curious about? Okay, so let's take about two, three minutes or so. Turn to your neighbor, introduce yourself, and use the back channel. We'll figure out how this is going. All right. Mariel, how's the, uh, the Twitter back channel looking? What, how are some people feeling? Um, some people are feeling frustrated. Um, someone's uh, feeling pretty surf rock. Surf rock, all right. Uh, some people are really worried their phones will die during your talk. <laughs> yeah, that's, a, that's a general feeling, yeah, exactly. iPhone anxiety. Cool. What about expectations? Has anybody posted anything they're expecting? Um, not so much yet. I think it's general excitement. Great. Excellent. Jeffrey, how about the live in-person back channel? Yeah, okay. So let's get a sense as to what people are expecting and or how people are feeling. So in no particular order, some current responses are surprisingly optimistic and energized. All right. A little tired. Ah. Moderately tired, but with interest and engaged in the topic. <laughs> uh, we have an expectation one. Uh, yes. Expecting this talk to have something to do with challenging traditional notions of scholarship and the influence on perceptions of quality, authority, etc. That's a great expectation. I, I hope that happens too. Uh, okay, so we'll keep that coming in. Um, and indeed, yes, uh, a big part of this talk is about challenging um, and questioning really some of the assumptions, the, some of the common sense that goes into what counts as scholarship uh, in the academy. Um, and beyond just challenging though, this talk is also about proposing some options um, and exploring some alternatives and uh, looking at some alternatives and seeing the possibilities that open up uh, in, those in those options, in those alternatives. Okay. So my goal here is not just to have uh, a negative critique, but to leave us with a, a positive critique as well, right? uh, something that we can take away with us. All right. So that said, um, let's get back to the talk here. Here's kind of the rough overview of the talk. So I'm going to discuss uh, three different aspects of this idea of producing knowledge in the academy. Um, I'm going to come at it primarily from the perspective of performance studies. So we're going to go through a little bit about how to think about the, the process of producing knowledge as a performance. And if we are performing, knowledge production in the academy, what kind of performance is it? What, what kinds of things do those performances include? And what kinds of things are excluded in those kinds of performances? In what ways do we already know that we are not supposed to perform when we're in the academy? What kinds of ways of being do we already kind of feel in our bodies are somehow not allowed in the academy? And conversely, what kinds of things do we kind of assume are how we are supposed to perform in the academy? From there, I'm going to go into this idea of decolonizing and cover a few specific aspects of, um, you know, if, if we're thinking about knowledge in the academy, why decolonizing? Why this word decolonizing? In what ways might we think of the academy as a colonizing uh, enterprise? Uh, and is it kind of odd to think of that as a colonial uh, imperial project that we're still part of? And if so, how do we go about decolonizing it? Okay. Um, both of those I want to connect with implications for the digital humanities. Um, what kinds of things count as texts? Uh, what, what kinds of questions should the digital humanities draw from these two different fields? Uh, what, what kinds of options become available in the digital humanities through these two different uh, intersections? So throughout I'm going to have these exercises that we're going to have. Um, so there are three exercises. The first exercise is going to be taking a look at this idea of a text and thinking about how knowledges get produced through texts. Okay. The second exercise is going to be about how performances connect with texts. 
And the third exercise is going to be about, well, how do you now go about decolonizing these texts? Okay. Thinking about performances then, this itself is a performance, right? Uh, this is a speaking performance. I'm up here as a speaker. And one of my goals is to kind of decolonize this performance itself, right? Instead of me being up here as the primary producer and representer and transmitter of knowledge, I'm really hoping to invite you all into being co-producers, co-performers, co-creators of knowledge. Um, and it's an invitation. It's not a compulsion. And uh, if you choose not to, that's, that's totally fine. Audiencing is also a powerful performance. All right, so given that, let's take a look. Let's do our first exercise. Okay. You've got this police report. Right? This is an odd, strange police report, I think. Right? How many of you here know the incident that this police report is referring to? Good, OK. How many of you here don't know at all? This, this police report is totally new to you. OK, great, excellent. All right. Um, I'm not going to say much more about the police report, because we're going to think about this police report as a text. Right? Those of you who know this incident know that this text was just one part of many texts and many performances that were at play during that incident. But those of you for whom this text is new, hey, cool, welcome. Uh, thinking about just this text, okay, this text constructs knowledge in a very particular way. There are certain kinds of things that are in this text shaped to be facts. Right? What are those things? What does this text very intentionally create as knowledge? Right? That's one area that you could discuss with the neighbor and focus on. Or if we are a room full of critical humanists and scholars in the academy, uh, maybe you're already attuned to the many things that's missing in this text, the many kinds of knowledges that this text very deliberately obfuscates, leaves out, is silent about. So if you want, in your response, you can focus on that second aspect, what's missing in these texts. What, so what I'm asking you to do is to choose one of these two things and use the back channel or use the index cards to kind of respond to that. Either, what do you think is knowledge in these texts? What, how does this text shape knowledge? Or what's missing? Okay, take a few minutes. All right, so let's check in a little bit. You can, you can continue wrapping up, that's okay. Let's check in with our um, back channels here. Um, and then, you know, I mean, you, you all can also voice up too. Uh, Mariel, on the Twitter back channel there, what, what are people saying are some facts or ways that the report seems to be constructing knowledge? Um, something constructed as knowledge is that he uh, is textually identified as an offender and defendant pretty clearly. Um, um, this race is clearly labeled on the report. Um, and then some things missing, um, why he was arrested in any clear sense, um, and the fact that the incident took place at his home. Right. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, just for the paragraph. Thank you. There we go. Yeah. Yeah, so the, the report seems to construct Gates, the offender, in very, very specific ways. Um, and things that are missing seem to be more contextual. Uh, you know, purposes, motivations, why the arrest took place, uh, more information about the residence, maybe the nature of Gates' presence in, that, in his own residence, things like that. Um, what about the uh, from the index cards? Uh, the IRL channel is commensurate with the digital one. Uh, <laughs> facts include the geography of the encounter, where they stood, who spoke to whom. Um, a number of people noted that uh, the races of all the individuals involved are named. Uh, some things that people said were missing, uh, tone, body language, there's a lot also questioning the uh, eyewitness account, noting that there's a lot that seems to be missing from it, or it seems to be constructed in very particular ways. So. Right, yeah. Right, so, so those of you who know this incident, right, what do you feel about how this report shaped that incident? What do you know about the incident that's not in this report? He's a famous professor, right? Henry Louis Gates, Jr., right? Uh, renowned scholar of, uh, gosh, I mean, so many things. Uh, one of the few Harvard presidential professors, right? Um, okay. 
So Gates had just returned from a trip to China, um, and uh, you know he had come from the airport uh, with his driver, the, the airport car service that had, that had brought him back home. Um, they discovered that there seemed to have been an, a, an attempted robbery at the at his house. The door was jammed, so they couldn't get in the front door. Uh, Gates was suffering from a severe cold uh, from the long flight from China, and uh, the driver, uh, an African American man, helped him carry his bags from the front of the residence to the back to get in. So Gates c gets in the back of the residence, calls uh, to report the robbery. Uh, you know, actually, no, it calls. Harvard maintenance to report the door uh, being broken. Okay. So that scene there, you know, Gates and his driver walking away from the residence is what a neighbor sees and reports as two suspicious black men with backpacks. Um, okay. And hence that's why the police officer shows up at the scene. Right. From there you have this cascading sequence of events that eventually leads to Gates being arrested. But yeah, so tone, intonation, body language is missing from this report. Why might that be important, whoever it is that, that uh, uh, said that? Well, we, we don't know how the police officer is responding. I mean, he just says, you know, I, I asked him this question, and then I moved over here, and I radioed sort of how, you know, how Gates understands that. Might right. explain why he responds. Yeah, so we don't have a motivation. We don't get a sense as to the actual dynamism of that encounter. Um, it's important because there was no crime being committed, but it escalated to the point somehow where someone was arrested for something going on. Right. The initial sequence there is there's nothing happening there. Gates shows us, you know, he's in his own house for crying out loud, right? Okay. But and we get a sense from the report that he's exasperated, but the reason why he's exasperated is kind of obscure in the report. Right? Instead, the, the, uh, the policeman's performance is positioned in this kind of like, I asked him a question, <laughs> I couldn't handle it, I walked out, I arrested him. Okay. So there's a sequencing, this, this positioning of certain bodies and uh, motives behind those bodies. Right? Um, if you think about how this report constructs the way the police officer is behaving versus how Gates is behaving, what are some patterns that you pick up? So it, it just seems like the police officer is very passive and the black man is very aggressively pursuing him, almost begging to be arrested. He keeps trying to move away and the guy keeps chasing after him and you know, railing about like, there's his case. And I just can't, I mean, obviously it's possible to keep out of my mind what's going on right now and like the construction of like the demonic black man like charging at me like he just won't leave me alone yeah. coming after me you know. yeah throughout the report the police officers actions are positioned in some kind of this very rational and retreating. retreating right okay whereas Henry Lewis Gates actions are positioned as this irrational monstrous yeah, in addition to that, I was just noticing with the language, the verbs, when he describes, when the police officer describes his um, language or the witness's language, it's told and asked. And when he describes Gates's language, it's, it's demanded or it, there's an aggression there, even in the words that he chooses to describe the verb. Yeah. Right, the, the verb that articulates what they're saying. Yeah, so here's his event. Okay, but the way it's transcribed onto the page, the, the word choices there right, convey a little bit. Right? They, they're supposed to evoke, suggest that, oh, the police, the police officer didn't do anything wrong here, was just doing his job. Right? Why did this strange person respond in this really aggressive and menacing and threatening way? Right? Okay, yeah. I was kind of interested in the very unimportant parts where like the strung out yeah, it's constructing this atmosphere of chaos, focusing on things that seem totally irrelevant to this.
Yeah. So the report leads up to the critical moment where the arrest is justified. All right. And the whole report is kind of justifying that arrest. But for that arrest to happen, Gates has to be outside. If he is inside his house, his own house, no crime has occurred. Right? But if he is outside his house and he's continuing to, as the report puts it, sort of you know, be the sort of yelling and shouting and so on, now he's outside, even though he's on his own porch. Right? State law says that if you're visible by the public and you're being disorderly, then you're public disorderly and you can be arrested for that. All right. This kind of charge, this kind of crime, it's known as contempt of cop. Right? It's such a bogus kind of charge, but cops have it as an access right, that they can use uh, to basically cite anybody if they think you know, they can just say, well, it seemed like this person was being disorderly in public. Right. So in terms of this text and the production of knowledge, right, it's taken an event, it's taken a person, it's taken bodies, and it's tried to capture what was said. It's t taken away the dynamism, the movement, the action. Right. Instead, it's focused on fixing events in time and space. This happened, then this happened, then this happened, therefore I had to do this. And there's a certain logic that's in this report. Okay. And what's missing in this report are all the performances, all the other logics that are, that are possible that were at play. Okay. Now, I chose this report uh, very, very strategically to kind of tie into current events. Right. This happened five years ago, but this kind of thing has been happening for decades right. in terms of aggressive policing uh, of black and brown bodies. Any of these kinds of aggressive policing, these kinds of reports, these kinds of textual artifacts become validated and authorized as the only legitimate representation of knowledge, the only legally valid representation of knowledge. Right? Eyewitness accounts are then kind of you know, not seen as equally legitimate because this is the actual report. Right? So instead of reports like this, Right. If you want to think about how it is that these kinds of texts acquire this kind of legitimacy, the parallel I want to draw is to think about how in the academy, too, texts, validated texts, authorized texts, have a similar kind of legitimacy to them. Right. They have a weight, they have a prestige to them, and in, in the academy, there are certain kinds of things that count way more than other kinds of experiences. Right. So. Dwight Conkergood in uh, 1995 uh, spoke about going beyond the text. He advocated for uh, you know, a, a critical performative politics. Um, and he criticized this idea that there's uh, textual fundamentalism in the academy. But he was quoting Edward Said to say that there's ways that in the academy we prefer the schematic authority of a text to the disorientations of direct encounters with the human. Okay. And so Conkergood said that in the academy we have a textual paradigm that really is focused on capturing and colonizing knowledge. And he's speaking specifically about ethnography, right, in terms of an anthropology of experience. When you're going to, in ethnography, when you're trying to represent knowledge of other people, there's this idea that you go and you do field work and you represent that knowledge as a textual artifact that you publish back home in the academy for a very specific kind of audience. If you think about this police report, who is the audience? Who is the intended audience for this police report? Other police officers, right? To justify, look, this is, these are the actions I had to take in order to do this. Right? Who are the, in, who's the intended audience for an academic article in a journal? Other academics, Other academics right? right? to say, well, look, you know, th this is how I produce the knowledge, and these are, these are the logics, and these are the sanctioned logics of the institution uh, in producing this knowledge. Clearly, yes, of course, there are things that are not in this, but hey, this is how our institution works. These are, this is the kind of report that's expected right, to justify my actions in constructing this knowledge this particular way. So there's a long body of work criticizing the ideology of what counts as knowledge in the academy, right? Um, ways that, you know, what counts as knowledge is often a scientific uh, approach 
Conkergood again says, the dominant way of knowing in the academy is that of empirical observation and critical analysis from a distanced perspective. Knowing that and knowing about something else. Right? This is a view from above the object of inquiry. Knowledge that is anchored in paradigm and secured in print. This propositional knowledge is shadowed by another way of knowing, Conkergood says, a different way of knowing that is grounded in active, intimate, hands-on participation and personal connection. So Conkergood's setting up these two different ways of knowing. These are it's a very harsh binary. There are multiple ways of knowing. But he's saying that in the academy, this idea of knowledge as being distanced and, and uh, uh, critical, he connects this with modernity. He says, since the Enlightenment project of modernity, that first way of knowing, distanced critical analysis, has been preeminent. It marches under the banner of science and reason, and it has disqualified and repressed other ways of knowing that are rooted in embodied experience. Okay. So what gets squeezed out by this, Conker Good says? He calls it an epistemic violence. It's the whole realm of complex, finely nuanced meaning that is embodied, tacit, intoned, gestured, improvised, co-experienced, covert. Right? All the more deeply meaningful because of its refusal to be spelled out. So there's a critical distinction that I want to draw from that. Right? It's not about just plurality for plurality's sake. It's not about just alternative modes of representing and experiencing knowledge for their sake. It's about a specific attention to the kinds of ways of being that are threatened, right. that are under surveillance. Right. Things, say for example, the experiences of folks that are in this country but are not authorized to be here in this country. Okay. Their experiences, right, it's very, very risky for them, for their experiences to be put into print because there's a very strong legal threat that happens to that. Right? So what are the experiences of the subaltern, right? of those that are not in positions of power in the society? Right? And why would it be that something like an academic project would be very, very threatening to those experiences, to those life, to those embodied lives? Okay? Because subordinate people do not have the privilege of explicitness, the luxury of transparency. Right? We can say, oh, we have an option here. They can come. They can have clear and direct communication. But subordinate people do not have that privilege. So, you know, uh, as a counter to that, I think I put my clicker somewhere else, but that's okay. All right. Conkergood suggested that we think about performance as a way to get at this. Right? And he called, he distinguished three different ways of thinking about performance. Right? When you're thinking about performing, let's say, a stage act, a, a the theatrical act. You can think about it as an imitation, right? trying to hold true to exactly what happened right? and reproduce it exactly that way. Think of, say, for example, a stage production of Hamlet. Right? And a mimetic approach to Hamlet would try to hold true as much as possible to the historical accuracy of the text and so on and so on and so forth. Same with this police report. If we wanted to restage it exactly as it was, we would follow it as if it were a stage script and not really question anything else about it. If we move to the poetic way of thinking about performance right, and try to invent, try to make meaning out of a text, right, this is a way, for example, with Hamlet, instead of reproducing it exactly as it was, you kind of creatively reimagine it, right, situate it in a different context, and then see what happens. Okay. Um, similarly with this, right, one of the things I like to do with my students is stage this text as scenes. And you'll notice that there are critical parts here where time seems to kind of blur away. And it doesn't become apparent until you actually put yourself in the scene and you pretend to be the police officer and you realize, wait, at this scene, I've got Gates' ID in my hand. In this next scene, I'm magically outside the residence with the ID in my hand. OK, now this explains why Gate might follow you outside. right? It's not like he's chasing you because he's aggressive. You've got his ID. You're walking out the door with his ID. Of course somebody, hey, where are you going with my ID? Come back here, right? That's completely absent in the test. And it doesn't actually become apparent to a lot of folks until they're actually experiencing it as a poetic act, as a poetic performance. But Conker could advocate for a third way of thinking about performance, the kinetic way. Okay, this is about breaking and remaking. Right? And this is the critical shift that we need to make in the academy as well. Right? There are ways to imagine a text and try to do a text differently. Right. You can write differently. You can poetically make meaning inventive, in inventive ways. But to actually transgress it, right, 
That's the next step. Transgressing means calling into question the assumptions behind a text like this, behind a performance like this, and bringing in those other perspectives, those other performances. Um, so what I want to do is show you some examples of what I'm talking about. Uh, by the way, I have a, a resource page that has um, some of the text that I'm talking about here. It's up on my, on my blog, and the, I'll have a link for this put up at the end, and you can refer to it as well. Um, so the, the, the source text from Conquer Good and so on, I've got some links. So I want to show you an example of what a kinetic performance might look like um, when written down. This is a paper that's trying to evoke those moments of silences that are, are hard to actually describe in writing. Uh, and the, this, this paper explores moments of silence around issues of race. And so what I do in this paper is actually construct a dialogue, a scene, where a sequence of events happens. And then in response to those events, I have multiple options, but I'm not sure exactly which ones to choose from. You know, this, in this particular event, um, my wife and I were in St. Louis nine years ago. Um, and a woman asked my wife a very racist question about me. And in that moment, of course, something got said. I continued the conversation. But it's one of those moments, you know, that you look back upon and you're like, oh, I should have said that. I really wish I would have said that. I really wanted to say that. There's no way I could have said this. I would have gotten into trouble if I said this. Right. One of those, th that kind of moment that kind of stays with you. You linger on it. You re-perform it in your mind over and over again. So this paper was a way for me to perform that right, and bring that moment alive and to bring the audience along in a way that they can kind of imagine that. And they can construct the scene however they want. Right. And each of those cards, each of those moments leads to a different meaning, a different interpretation in the text. Okay. This is just one option. Um, I'm running out of time, I think. Right? Uh, but what I, what I wanted to do now is ask uh, a different exercise. This can be a, a very quick one. What I'd, like you to do to, uh, what I'd like to ask you all to think about is, if you think about performances, right, and think about the performances in this report, what are some op other performances? What are alternate performances that you can imagine using this report to stage? If you were teaching about this incident in a class, right, how might using performance allow you to get at stuff in this text differently? If you were writing about, a, about an event like this, or about Michael Brown, or about Eric Garner, any one of the, you know, every 28 hours you have an incident that you can write about. If you're writing about it, how can, what might performance enable you to do in that writing. Uh, take a moment, turn to your neighbor, discuss some ideas, and uh, put it on the back channel if you'd like. So Mariel, what are some people, what are people tweeting on? Well, let's, let's focus on alternative performances. What kinds of things do people imagine can counter this report? Um, well, let me create an example. Someone gave, um, for example, alternative, um, focusing on the performance of the cop. Um, they say revisiting the power dynamic of this encounter. Who has power? The person with the gun. Um, focusing on that. Thing. Right, right. So reperforming this, but fo you know, keeping the lens, if you will, of the performance on the aggressiveness, the violence inherent in all the tools, the, wep the weaponry that a cop carries with them on a daily basis. Right. Focusing in on the tool belt, for example, and looking at you know, the pepper spray, the mace, the, the, the baton, the gun, the knife. Right. Uh, the, the armor that a, that a cop wear, wears. Right? There's a great book called The Rise of the Warrior Cop. Right? And you can reimagine that book as a performance right? and, and you know, perform the, the masculinity of the cop, if you will, that way. Great. What are some other options that are? Um, someone said if you recast the police officer as someone who asked how they could help instead, how would that have changed the encounter? Right. Okay. So transgressing the expected role of a cop in that situation Okay, from being more accusatory to actually being more helpful. Right? To actually take that serve and protect idea and to imagine that as a utopian concrete performance. Right? What would that look like? Right? 
That kind of rethinking, that kind of reimagination, by the way, is actually part of some of the community policing work, right? Some of the training that, that cops go through is very much a performative transgressing and remaking, a breaking and remaking of the image, the performance they've constructed for themselves as to what it means to police a community. Right. Great, thanks. What about the, in, in real life, the IRL channel? Sure, so uh, we also had an alternative uh, community policing angle. Um, there was one suggesting performing the report through a digital medium, allow, which would allow you to then engineer possibly real-time duration into the experience. Right. No. Uh, maybe overlaid with, with a, a map, you know, showing the neighborhood, showing the, the house, showing the location of various things, and showing the respective positions of the two players as they go through this. Right? And you can actually scroll back and look at what happened before the, the neighbor called the police as well. Right? Great. Uh, there was another alternative. Uh, multiple animations of the scene as told from different perspectives report the Gates account being introduced. Right. The, the Gates account of the event, totally missing in this report, have that in there. But also expanding that. One of the key reasons why the cop feels like they can, he can justify the arrest is he says at the end, he comes out, he looks around, he sees a bunch of alarmed citizens you know, on the street. And he says, oh my God, these citizens are alarmed by the actions of this person, therefore I must arrest this person. To actually maybe have some of their you know, uh, perspective saying, of course we were alarmed. There were like five different police cars on the street and this is our neighbor whom we know well. We were worried for him. You know, that's the alarm we're seeing on our face. Okay. That totally changes that kind of, you know, it, it debunks, it transgresses, it remakes that interpretation that's being held up as being the only valid interpretation. Okay. Great. Um, do, do people want to suggest anything else uh, live? Uh, uh, something that you've seen in this, um, that's also continues to happen, is uh, the, the white collar who uh, initiated this entire crisis. Um, and that the white collar results in a lot of black and brown bodies. Right. You know, the neighbor's perspective, the person who calls the cops. In many of these events that have been happening, Right. One of the common threads is somebody calls the cops. Somebody interprets what they see as somehow a threat, and they call the cops. What's going on there? What's the logic going on? What's the common sense? What's the ideology that's, that's shaping that up? Okay. So in thinking about this uh, you know, as a, a different approach to knowledge production, um, what I'd like to do now is shift gears, and in the interest of time, link this up with decolonizing, decolonizing methodologies uh, as, um, well, well, we'll skim through this. I had a third exercise in mind, but I'm going to leave that off, and instead we'll go straight to the Q&A after this next part. So the connection I'm trying to draw is, again, with thinking about academic knowledge production. Um, when you think about the logics of this report, the logics of a text, the logics of what, it, what it's like to represent experience, certain things get positioned there as normal, right, as standard. Uh, in the Gates account, in that performance account, one of the logics that comes up often in, in common sense is, well, Gates shouldn't have mouthed off. Well, Gates should have been more cooperative. Right? And you can see that same logic show up over and over again in the Michael Brown case, in, in the Eric Garner case. Well, if only you know, he hadn't attacked, if only he hadn't done this. There's a, there's a taking in an assumption, right, a, a common rut, if you will, uh, that, that runs through that sentence, right, of this is what we expect the other to behave like. This is the sanctioned behavior that we want to happen. Anything that deviates from that must be policed. Right? Similarly, in the academy, there is a mechanism at play. This is what uh, this is why Dwight Conker could call it textual fundamentalism. One of the ways that fundamentalism works is there is this construction of what should be expected behavior. Right? And anything that's, that deviates from that must be sanctioned. I can speak a little bit about fundamentalism from personal experience. Um, I grew up in a, as a fundamentalist Hindu uh, in a fundamentalist Muslim country, and then I became a fundamentalist Christian when I was here in the U.S., I was a fundamentalist Christian for four or five years. I was a George W. Bush supporter. Um, uh, and then things changed after that, so I'm not going to say much more about that. <laughs> but one of the things about fundamentalism is that never during those three different fundamentalisms did I think of myself as a fundamentalist. And the people that I was with didn't think of themselves as fundamentalists either. Right? 
Similarly, in the academy, I don't, I don't think any of us in the academy here you know, set out to say, well, we're going to be textual fundamentalists today. Right? <laughs> but that ideology kind of plays out in the ways that we expect an argument to be made, in the ways that we expect students to write, in, uh, write a paper, for example, in the ways that we expect and recognize as a valid construction of knowledge uh, when somebody is up for tenure. Okay? So what decolonizing methodologies offer to that approach is to really challenge and question the ideologies of knowledge that we have uh, and how our ideologies, these assumptions about what counts as valid ways of constructing knowledge are rooted in Europe as, as origin stories. I had an example I wanted to show here about if you ask folks the question about rhetoric and you say, you know, what's a typical story about rhetoric in the academy? A very typical story about rhetoric in the academy is, well, rhetoric originated in ancient Greece. Uh, and I've got an example that I'm going to show up uh, that you can see later on. That's, that's just a total lie. Uh, you know, rhetoric originated way before and beyond the Greeks. There's been tons of research that show so many different civilizations having so many different ways of thinking about rhetoric. Right? But because in the Western Academy, Greek and Roman narratives are so central, it's those modes of argument that get enshrined as the normal way to do things. So what decoloniality does, decolonizing allows us to turn the gaze toward challenging those logics in the academy. Right? Asking, wait, why is this mode of argument, this sequence of argument, these ways of making a point, why are these the only ways of making a point? Right. What about other options? Okay. Um, so those other options, again, it's not about uh, just plurality for plural, uh, plurality's sake. Right? It's focusing on specific options that have been systematically excluded and, and you know, dismissed from the academy. Right? So feminist writing, for example, has a lot to offer in this. A lot of work has been done in, in feminist work, feminist ideologies in the academy that have tried to rehabilitate, more than rehabilitate, really center right, the idea of experience and emotion as central. Uh, to what it means to write in the academy, how to write and how to make an argument in the academy. Um, so uh, I, well, I'll, I'll go on from this and we'll skip past this. So what are the implications for digital humanities? Um, a big implication is thinking about performance and decoloniality as a way to really challenge what the common sense is in the academy about what counts as a text. Uh, and this is, this is hard, right? because common sense is something that you know, we just kind of carry around with us. Stuart Hall, uh, channeling Gramsci, called common sense this ideologically contoured terrain. It's shaped, it's, it's uh, you know, uh, ideologies have kind of um, almost like a field, you know, they're like tractors have, have grooved ruts into this common sense, so that when you're talking, when you're designing a course, when you're thinking about an assignment that you want from your students, it kind of just falls into place. Well, I, I must ask for an essay. It, it must have the following points. It must be made in such and such a way. And then there's all this construction around why that common sense makes sense. Well, we're here to teach students a certain way of thinking. That, that's, that's how you make thinking happen. Right? And so what the digital humanities offers is a way to actually counter that and say, no, wait, hang on a second. Right? Here are a bunch of other ways of making an argument. Right? And these ways are mostly collaborative, they're interactive, right? they're messy, they open up the idea of who gets to produce knowledge, who gets to ask these questions to a wider range of audiences. Right? Um, I want to end by showing a collaborative uh, example that uh, I've been working on with, a, uh, with dear colleagues of mine. Um, and this is a project that arose out of collaborative storytelling. So thinking about storytelling as a very ancient way of making an argument, you know, much more ancient than the Greeks and the Romans. Um, one of the, uh, the things that um, uh, my, I've, I've two colleagues, uh, here we go. Brian Keith Alexander is a scholar of performance studies out in California, and Claudia Marrera, who is uh, right next door here at UMass Amherst. And what we did is uh, we wanted to explore this idea of literacy 
and we set it up as a round robin storytelling. So I wrote a short story and then sent it by email to Bryant without any further discussion or you know, structuring of it. Bryant then responded to that with a short story of his own that he then sent on to Claudio. So Claudio gets an email now with a story by me and a story by Bryant. Claudio then writes a story in response to that and sends it to me. So a couple weeks later, I get an email with now two other stories. right? And we agreed that we were not going to do any pre-writing, that we were going to wait until we got the stories back. But of course, we're storytellers, we're performers, we had an idea, I had an idea, well, I wrote the short story, I'm really hoping they pick up on this theme or this pattern. And two weeks later goes by, I get these two stories, I'm like, oh my god, wow. What I initially thought of, I can't do that anymore because Brian has said this about you know, his life with, with his father in Louisiana and Claudio said this about his life in Brazil and it's evoking all these other things. Right? This experience of doing a collaborative story where you begin to realize, oh, you know, that reminds me of this and, and suddenly knowledge is now being produced by everybody who's listening and telling the story. So we performed that at a conference and then people said, well, you should, you should publish this. I'm like, well, how do we publish this thing as a collection of stories? How to show that kind of interactive you know, uh, mixing there? And so we came up with this interactive multimedia text. And the idea here is, uh, and there's a link to this, by the way, on the resource page, is each of these colors represents one of us. And this first part here is a joint introduction that all three of us perform together. Right. So the, on the left, that's me. In the middle is Bryant, and in the middle, in the, in the, on the right, is Claudio. So I would say speaking. Bryant says writing. Claudio says embodying. Right, and go on from there. But because it's laid out this way, you can actually, you know, you're the reader. You can choose to reperform this in different ways. And as it goes through, so this is the, the introduction, the preamble. We are all taking turns doing this, um, you know, and we're saying this is a ex exploration of collaborative autoethnography. Um, we're, we want to uh, look at the vulnerability and power of uh, making knowledge count. We want to evoke a turning of the gaze toward Western systems of knowledge. And we're really looking to bring these things into academic knowledge production, theory, song, analysis, poem, story, rage, joy, into this. And then, those slide out. And this is where I get to tell my story. This is the, short, the first story that began this whole thing off. Right. So I have some memories. I, I say that I'm, I'm worried about where the story will take me, and I leave it at that. In response to that, Bryant, his story comes in. I start my story out by saying, I know I am afraid of where the story will take me. Bryant says, I am not afraid <laughs> of where the story will take me. Bryant has a lot more experience in the academy than I do, and he wants to kind of show, look, this is why I still do this. Right. Now, very intentionally, what we did with this is we wanted to foreground the storytelling as the act of making an argument. But this is still an academic argument. So we're still citing and building upon sources. But that's in the background. And if people want that, you have to click this, and the citations come forward. Right? Otherwise, they're hidden. Because we don't want no parentheses and numbers you know, in, in our story. Who tells a story with citations? You know? I remember one time when parenthesis, Stuart Hall, comma, page 291, parenthesis, <laughs> said, quote, da, 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 da. And it doesn't happen that way, right? And really wanted to kind of hide that back. There's more to this. There's, uh, at, at, at a certain point, we bring in a song, we bring in video, but I'm going to leave that there for now. What I want to suggest is, for digital humanities, I see a lot of intersections with using performative texts like this. This, the, the tweets that you've been putting out, and also the, the um, uh, index cards that you've been giving, right? If you want to think about a digital humanities project that, that looks at police narratives, right, as performances to be questioned, critiqued, challenged, digital humanities provides, uh, you know, the potential, the possibility of having, say, a digital archive of multiple police reports of these different really, really troubling incidents, and then commingled with that, right, these alternative performances, these stories from eyewitnesses, you know, timeline tools that show and explore the actual, you know, um, uh, uh, complexity of what happened. Right? So that, that set of tweets could be the beginnings of an archive project that goes further from here. 
I'm going to end there. What I'd like to do now is, uh, is open it up for uh, Q&A and other options, other questions people have on digital humanities. But uh, thank you all very much for your time. And uh, <laughs> thanks for us. Yes, so, I'm hearing what you're saying about certain kinds of languages and ways of talking and being as being more acceptable than others, right? And I'm thinking how, in writing, of course, right? And I'm thinking how the common argument for this is the notion it's because people need to be able to communicate across all these vast differences. So, these sort of academic standards are like a lingua franca, right? The idea that it's giving us a common language, a commonality. And, I think as your talk very compelling shows, in general, thinking about digital humanities, of course, we're going to overcome this. But what does it mean then to have to almost layer for the scholar, like the scholar who loves the layman, but also the professional scholar? What does it mean to have to layer all these other kinds of trainings in different kinds of listening and communicating on top of the trainings that are already sort of implicit? I don't think always in bad ways in the work you need to become a scholar. Right. How do we think about that? Right, absolutely. It's a great question. It's not about drawing a binary, you know, and it's not about saying that the ways that we already know how to do scholarship in the academy have to be discarded or thrown out. Right? It's about seeing the variety of options that can complement, supplement, enhance that, right? not discard it entirely. Um, when it comes to performance studies, for example, the argument made there was it, it isn't to say we're no longer going to write about performance anymore. We're only going to accept dissertations that are performances themselves. It's about saying, no, a certain part of the dissertation can have the things that are the strengths of producing an academic, traditional academic argument, coupled with a performative element to the dissertation. Right? Um, same with digital humanities, I would say, right? is the, the, the community that you're trying to communicate with to, to make a point in a certain way doesn't have to be the only community that counts. Right? That community needs to be able to consider how you're making that point to a variety of other communities as well. Uh, Malia Powell, who was the chair of the uh, College Composition and Communication uh, Conference uh, two years ago, she said this very, very powerfully. You know, she said, you know, when I'm talking about decolonizing our discipline, our scholarship, and our teaching, um, I'm talking about the actual students in our classroom, their bodies, how the bodies are marked and mobilized. right? Um, I'm talking about critical orient orientations to knowledge making. And that's kind of really opening that up and saying, let's see what are the multiple ways that you can have this, this kind of valid knowledge. And she said, you know, let's learn to see all the options. We have a lot to learn. Uh, what she said. Um, uh, you know. The argument is, there is something to be, to be learned for a scholar in maybe learning at least one more way of layering knowledge on top of what you already know. Right. And then see where it goes from there. Does that? Curry. Uh, I'm interested in hearing a little bit more about the way in which different knowledges are valued, you know, or the different valuation of knowledges. So thinking about uh, this police report uh, versus uh, if there was someone live tweeting the event um, of, of Gates being arrested. Uh, is there a moment in which it, do you think that the digital humanities uh, has an aspiration of, um, of wanting to be validated or wanting to be taken as seriously as these older, more established uh, roots of knowledge uh, that are, you know, that are really conform, uh, comported and informed through, through power. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the question is, do I think that digital humanities has an aspiration to be taken as seriously as some of the older traditional ways of, of power, powerfully produced knowledge? I don't know if digital humanities has what kinds of aspirations it has. I think it should aspire to decenter those uh, power structures right, um, that are constructed in such a way to privilege these kinds of reports, right, these kinds of ways of seeing an event. Um, and that's what the performative cultural politics uh, you know, call is in performance studies, in digital humanities. It is about recognizing that this is a cultural struggle. Right? This is about 
This is a popular struggle. This is about challenging what a lot of people take for granted as common sense. And that's, that's political. Right? And that has stakes to it. It's visceral. Uh, and it has to be debated. It has to be argued. It has to be fought for um, uh, in, in, in ways that, uh, like Stuart Hall and Gramsci would say, call for a coalition uh, you know, of allies and support from multiple sources. Right? Um, so I don't know if digital humanities can do it on its own. But it is a political struggle that I, I would say is worth having and digital humanities should aspire to. What do you, what do you feel about it? Uh, I, I mean, it's something I, I think about. I mean, in terms of the, let's say, Twitter itself as, as, as a particular platform, I, I have a collection of dead Twitter handles that, you know, that I, I cared about at some point. But I remember the first handle that, 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 I, that I just said, no more. Uh, it was when I was a grad student uh, in New York, and I had Brooklyn in, in, in my handle. And then I was followed, followed by a, uh, a real estate company. In that moment, <laughs> yeah, I was like, a, this done. space has already been compromised. Yeah. And now I, I find myself actually attempting to come back to this space. Uh, just thinking about what it means to, to acknowledge these other, these other forms right. uh, uh, of, of power, of economy. That, 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 that impact our worldview. And, and I still, I, I'm hopeful, but my hope sometimes is diminished by my cynicism. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, um, yeah, I resonate. Um, I was followed by a, a Twitter handle called uh, Great Aristotle Quotes. <laughs> and I was like, does this person even know? Like, you know, what the hell I think about Aristotle? Uh, <laughs> And in my job now as an instructional designer, I'm being followed by companies that want to sell all kinds of like educational technology solutions for commodification of courses and, and you know, online education and things like that. And um, you know, so there's this sense like if you, if you follow, I follow, I have to follow for my job, blogs on higher education. And sometimes it's damn depressing, you know, the kinds of voices that are dominant in those, in those blogs. These are voices of business leaders that say, yeah, the business model of higher education needs to change. Da, da, da. Um, I think there's a parallel there with digital humanities too, right? Uh, same with performance. There's a way for performance to get commodified, right? There's a way to say, well, we're going to privilege these kinds of performances. Look, it's, it's cool, it's sexy, look, it's visceral. But what's actually being shown as now valid performance may ha replicate the exact same exclusionary power dynamics that traditional print articles did. Same with digital humanities. If we have digital humanities that shifts toward a dominance of uh, ways of archiving uh, texts, right, that are privileged texts. So you have these repositories that like, ooh, look, here's the collection of such and such famous dead white person. Right? You know, how is that? challenging the politics of textualized knowledge. I, I would say maybe not very much, right? Um, but I, I think I have to have that Gramscian kind of like, uh, you know, uh, pessimism of the intellect and optimism of the will. You know, I, I have to be intellectually cynical about these things. I have to, you know, like Twitter and digital humanities performance to realize that none of them are the panacea, that, that they are all shaped ideologically by these powerful forces. But I have to believe that I have to do something and that others are doing something about it. And let's build a coalition around that. I think that this, this question in this idea speaks to me a lot about the dynamism of developing technologies and how they're constantly, it's constantly flux, it's changing. I mean, at one point that cash, that Brooklyn tag was really relevant to you personally and it was relevant in a different way until something in Twitter changed, something in that sort of or large, largely figured community change, right? So, I mean, it seems to me that's that's one of the kind of inherent problems in this discussion about decenter. How can we decenter if we're not sure what the center is? And maybe that's a good thing. I mean, maybe that forces us not to create new centers. Yeah. In, yeah. in, a, in a sense, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm I'm really intrigued by the same same question and how you think about working, say, in an interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary. Or a way that's not so defined by disciplinary bounds. You know, what what do you do if, as a scholar, you want your work to be relevant? You want it to reach people who would be interested in similar things, or who even would be interested in a totally different 
different say, fields or disciplines, but yet there's something about your approach or your methodology that would be useful to them. You know, how do we, how do we, how do we take advantage of the kind of fingers of the web and the, the virtual world and the, the sort of global scholarly community mm -hmm. to get get the word out about what we're doing in different ways? It's more than just the word. I mean, you, yeah. you know, it, this is just so exciting and, and problematic all of this. Yeah, and that's that's the uh, that's the big trick. Uh, Malia Powell says that's that's the trick that Western modernity does. It convinces you that it's the only game in town, right? Uh, ooh, I, uh, anyway, um, on the resource page, I have a few other links to communities of, of hope here, right? Um, there is a, uh, a movement called Remix the Dis. Uh, there's a hashtag for it, hash Remix the Dis, um, and it's about opening up multiple options for digital dissertations. And it's a cross-disciplinary effort uh, involving a lot of different scholars. Uh, they had their first conference earlier this year. They're going to have more next year. Uh, it was an MLA, too, that they had that. So you think of this powerful hegemonic you know, entity that shapes what, what uh, humanities uh, you know, uh, scholarship should be. They're there. Um, uh, I have uh, a community of scholars in performance studies that have a yearly conference. We just had our 10th conference uh, at the University of Illinois led by Norman Denzin and a bunch of other performance scholars. So there are these communities available. Um, there's a, a journal called Hybrid Pedagogy, and it's a digital journal. It's peer-reviewed, but it's open access, and it's interdisciplinary. It's got a lot of different options there. The piece that I just showed you uh, is uh, on a performance journal called Liminalities. Again, it's online. It's open access. It's peer-reviewed, uh, and it's beginning to count in, in tenure circles. Um, and that's the other, other key, is to have scholars who have gone through this uh, take advantage of the power they have. Uh, you know, okay, maybe you had to produce traditional academic knowledge in order to get tenure. Now you're on a tenure review board. Can you use your power to open up what counts for tenure? Right. And, the, and to examine, this is where decoloniality I think has a lot to offer, to examine what is shaping your response in that case toward a center. Right. And it ripples backward. So if, a, if I'm calling out and saying somebody who already has tenure and is now on a tenure review board has the responsibility to open it up okay, and take a risk by doing that, then somebody who's on the tenure, tenure track has the responsibility to take risks as well, especially with the graduate students that they are teaching. Right? And then those graduate students have a responsibility to take risks with the, the space that's been opened up for them with their students, with their undergraduates. Um, this is how I got into this, this kind of work. Uh, when I started, restarted grad school six years ago, uh, my, my mentor, my advisor was Claudio. He had just started at UMass. He was a first year tenure track professor. And he took a big risk by encouraging me to do this kind of work, which meant that I felt like I have a responsibility with my own students, my undergraduate students. You know, I couldn't, on one hand, rail and complain about how the academy is not letting me write this non-traditional scholarship, then turn around and say to my students, now nah, you've got to give me a five-paragraph essay. You've know, you got to have Aristotelian pathos, ethos, logos in here. Whereas, you know, I, I would be a hypocrite if I did that. Um, Rupika Rissam is going to be here in February. Uh, she has, uh, she's co-director of DH POCO, uh, Postcolonial Digital Humanities. She's been doing a lot of work in, in that area. She's going to speak about this, and, and I'm, I'm excited about that. Yeah. So this is a plug to continue coming to these conversations. Um, does that answer? Yeah. Thank you for up there. That was awesome. All right. Cool. <laughs> Thank, Thank you all so much.